Hi, everybody. Come on in, please. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the ASP Institute. Uh, welcome to the Aspen Institute's Hearst Lecture Series annual collaboration with the Aspen Strategy Group entitled America and the World, a conversation with former national security advisors. Uh, clearly, this is the most interesting pavilion in America right now. It's great to have all of you here. Um, can we please thank Bob and Soledad Hearst for making this lecture series possible? I also would like to observe that we are joined by many members of the Aspen Institute's Board of Trustees and many participating in the Aspen Strategy Group, but especially I'd like to call out uh, uh, the former president of the Aspen Institute, Walter Isaacson, who's here today. Uh, and the former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. So we are delighted that the Aspen Institute's Nick Burns is with us to lead this, con this remarkable panel. In addition to serving as director of the Aspen Strategy Group, Nick is the Goodman Family Professor for the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at Harvard, Universe at Harvard Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, as well as the faculty chair of the Future of Diplomacy Project and the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship. Previously, Nick was a member of, the Sec of Secretary of State John Kerry's Foreign Policy Board at State Department, and he served as Under Secretary of State for, for Political Affairs. Prior to that, he was Ambassador to NATO, Greece, and Spokesman for the State Department. He worked on the National Security Council staff, was Special Assistant to President Clinton, and Director of Soviet Affairs for President George Herbert Walker Bush. Please join me in welcoming Nick Burns, Condoleezza Rice, Susan Rice, Tom Donilon, and Stephen Hadley. Thank you. Dan, thank you very much. Well, the first thing I should do, uh, we've just gotten to know Dan the last couple of months. We're so impressed by his very strong start uh, as president and CEO is to salute Dan Porterfield. Thank you very much, Dan, for your leadership. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the second straight year, we thought we'd begin our Aspen Strategy Group meeting here um, with a conversation. Four of our members who um, have, share something in common. They had the toughest job in the United States government beyond the presidency, and that's National Security Advisor. Condoleezza Rice and Steve Hadley, both National Security Advisor for President George W. Bush, Tom Donilon and Susan Rice, both National Security Advisor for President Barack Obama. Um, we are on our 34th year at the Aspen Strategy Group. And the, <laughs> thank you. It was born because Republicans and Democrats needed a place to talk as Americans, a place where they could put aside politics and talk about the great issues of the day, Bill Perry, Sam Nunn, Brent Scowcroft were three of the four people who founded it. But the person who now has been our conscience, our founder, who's carried the history forward is Joe Nye. And I want you to salute Joe and Molly Nye for being here. We are still uh, imbued by that radical notion, especially now when we have red and blue divisions in America and conservative and, and liberal, um, that we've got to have a nonpartisan environment. We don't call ourselves bipartisan. We call ourselves nonpartisan. And we truly come together every year here in Aspen to take on one big issue. This year, it's the impact that these transformative changes in biotechnology, in artificial intelligence, in quantum computing, in robotics are going to have on American national security. We enjoy a technological edge over all of our rivals, and that edge could disappear very quickly. So we're gonna, I was gonna ask the four of our friends about that, but there's also an elephant in the room that we have to talk about first, and that's the policies of the present administration. Many of you, are, I assume, are Trump supporters. 
Uh, many of you, I assume, are not Trump supporters. Some of you are in between. I'm sure that both sides are represented in this room, and we are all Americans. Um, I'd start the questioning, and I want to call on Susan first, Susan Rice first, by saying this. Whether you support President Trump or don't support him, there's hardly anybody who's neutral, he is launching a revolution in American foreign policy in, in, in a few basic areas. He has been famously critical, maybe infamously critical of our alliances. He called the European Union a foe. We've never had a president so critical of NATO. And now openly ambivalent about Article 5, whether we should honor it to the smallest and newest member of the alliance, Montenegro. So there's that issue. There's the issue of trade, where the president has said no to most of the trade agreements that the last two administrations have been involved in, NAFTA here at home, which is being renegotiated. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, our proposed free trade agreement with the European Union, the two largest global economies, and now trade disputes with Canada, Mexico, Europe, South Korea, Japan, and China. So that's a big area. Third is immigration and refugees, where we've seen substantial changes in trying to restrict immigration to the United States, and particularly on refugees. There's 63 million refugees and internally displaced people in the world, the most since 1945, right now. And the United States is restricting the intake of refugees in a considerable way. That's a third major change. And fourth, and Madeline and I uh, organized two conferences together in Brussels and in Paris in late June with Europeans. And what we heard in this fourth area is that the biggest issue facing the Europeans today is the rise of anti-democratic populists who've taken over the government of Hungary, the government of Poland, the government of Turkey, and our coalition members in the government of Italy. And they're looking for American support for the survival of democracy in Europe, and they feel they're not getting it. So in those four areas, we are looking at a major shift. The question for the four national security advisors is, what's the import of this? What's the impact on our global leadership? What do you agree with, with President Trump? Where do you disagree? Susan Rice, lead us off. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for the opportunity to reprise this event again. I don't think it'll surprise you, Nick, uh, that for many of the reasons you've already listed uh, and some others, uh, the very short period, only 18 plus months in which uh, President Trump has been in office, uh, have in my estimation done extraordinary damage to US global leadership. Uh, I think there's, by any of the metrics you described, our alliances, uh, which have been the bedrock of our security uh, since the end of World War II, uh, are frayed. Um, our allies are now, in fact, considering how to balance against us. Um, we are viewed as being far more com comfortable in the, in the company of authoritarian leaders, uh, whether Erdogan or Duterte, Putin or Xi, whom we praise and uh, view with uh, un unusual amounts of affection, while we denigrate uh, the leaders of our closest allies, whether Canada, Germany, or the United Kingdom. The trade wars that we've begun uh, with our closest allies, including in Europe and, and Canada and our partner in Mexico, are not advancing uh, our efforts to deal with the real and most pervasive challenge, which comes from China. Uh, and the way in which we're approaching uh, the Chinese challenge is of dubious uh, utility. And in all of these things, um, I, when you add them together, and I would put also on the table the, you know, the decision to withdraw unilaterally um, from commitments that the United States has made that the rest of the world is, is heavily invested in, whether we're talking about the Paris Climate Agreement or the Iran nuclear deal, uh, or for a, a, an important group of countries, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, have left the world questioning um, the United States' uh, constancy, our values, um, and um, our ability to be, as we have been for decades, a source of stability and strength and predictability in the global order. I think, frankly, 
we are now at a point where the United States is argu arguably a net contributor to instability, which is a completely different role than we've ever played before. Um, and uh, I think there are real questions as to whether this damage uh, can be repaired. In, in, in if it is an eight-year term, can we recover from that? If it's a four-year term, given the pace of the damage that's been done, where will we stand? Will the world want us back in the role that we previously played? I think that's questionable. Um, and uh, so I think we have already seen great damage done in a very short period of time. Um, more to come, I suspect, and unclear whether this is damage that we can easily recover from. Susan, let me ask you a follow-up question. I'm going to try to give everyone a lot of time to speak and ask everyone follow-up questions. If, if Mike Pompeo were here, and we tried hard to get him here, but he had to be at the ASEAN meeting in Singapore, or if Jim Mattis were here, or John Bolton, I think what they would say, maybe reacting to my question, how has he changed American foreign policy? They'd look at the continuity. They'd say the global economy is humming. We're now at 3.9% unemployment, all major economies growing. The Saudis, Emiratis, Kuwaitis, the Gulf Arabs, very happy with the um, strongly counter Iran policies of President Trump. Israel feels that the relationship has been strengthened. If you talk to the Israeli leadership, and I think on balance, the president's tried really hard to get along and establish a relationship with um, Xi Jinping, and has tried to use that in the North Korea situation. So I think a Trump supporter or any of those three people would come back and say, but there has been progress. How would you respond to that? I'd take them in turn. Uh, with respect to Israel and the Gulf partners, there's no question that they are happier than they've been in a very long time. Uh, and But that, to me, is not necessarily a good thing. They're happy while the United States is um, ta turning a blind eye to the devastation in Yemen and doing nothing to, to roll it back. Um, we are in a very strange situation in Syria where we are not uh, actively engaged uh, either militarily or diplomatically. Um, with respect to Israel, we have basically said anything that the current government wishes to pursue, regardless of the impact on our interests or on Israel's long-term interests, is fine with us. And of course, the bogeyman is Iran, uh, and with some justification. But the decision to pull out of the nuclear deal, while I'm, it made the, uh, the Israelis and the Gulf partners quite happy, I think has been negative for their security and for ours in the long run. Uh, and it has certainly eroded our uh, relationships with Europe. Even this is the one issue it appears that that even Putin disagrees with the, the, the president on. Uh, so it, it is, in my estimation, you know, there's no question that they're happier. Whether that means that our interests are better served or not uh, is debatable. With respect to Xi Jinping, um, I do give the president some credit for the effort he has put into that personal relationship. However. Uh, it is a very hot and cold sort of thing. On the one hand, he goes to Beijing and says that Xi Jinping is extraordinary and, you know, his great relationship, great friendship. And on the other, uh, you know, some of the, the, particularly the economic policies that the president is pursuing are destabilizing, I would argue, and unlikely to accomplish the goal that we have set in terms of writing our economic relationship with China. On North Korea, I think uh, the Chinese role, the jury is out. They certainly, for a period of time, helped step up the pressure and, and, the, and the sanctions consistent with how they voted in the Security Council. But now that we have begun this diplomatic process and signaled that, um, that the problem is not as urgent as it once was, we're now seeing the Chinese relax their uh, pressure and sanctions and, and act in a way that may give Kim Jong-un some space to um, Slip the noose. <laughs> Thank you. Tom Donilon, how do you see it? Do you agree with Susan? Disagree? Well, a, couple, um, a couple of things. Um, one, on the economic point that you made, uh, Susan's absolutely right that we are the United States. Before I start, I wanted to mention one of the National Security Advisor who played an enormous role with this group, that's Brent Scowcroft, um, who was um, one of the founders. And I think a, one of our founders. Uh, and I think a, um, really a model for all of us. Uh, as national security advisors. Um, 
Um, on the question, so you mentioned the econ uh, economic issues. The truth is, of course, is that the United States is now a net exporter of uncertainty and instability in the world, including on the economic side. And all the U.S. economy on the heels of over $2 trillion of stimulus into an already hot economy had a pretty good quarter this, this uh, quarter. It's expected over the next year or so to do well. Uh, there's disruption around the world as a result of the number of the trade and other economic policies that we are, uh, that we're pursuing. But let me go through a couple of uh, kind of key, key analytical points, I think. Uh, one, um, this is a very different kind of president. There's no doubt about that. We've never seen a president of either party uh, approach the job in the way that President Trump's approached it in foreign policy since World War II. I think that's a fair statement. Uh, and it's been disruptive. He promised disruption, and he's brought disruption uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the job and to the world. Second, um, it has upended, it was in the process of upending, the order that's been in place since the end of World War II, which has been enormously beneficial to the United States, both in terms, and there had, that doesn't mean over the last 70 years there haven't been problems, right? And we haven't made mistakes. But the overall arc uh, of uh, the history is that the United States has benefited enormously from the post-World War II order that we led and put, and put in place. Uh, the elements of that, number three, alliances and a liberal trade order, leading democracy. I've never heard the president speak about democracy yet. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, international agreements, uh, international institutions are all elements that he has a different view on, uh, and in some cases some hostility to, but clearly kind of a pulling away from, those key, from these key elements. I think this has been especially difficult for our allies. Um, uh, particularly in Europe, although I think in, uh, in Asia as well, we can talk, we can talk about that. Uh, there has been a decrease in confidence. You know this world as well as anyone. I think that's a fair statement. I think there's a de decreased perception of reliability uh, among allies. I think there's a sense that they need to look elsewhere for uh, security and other relationships moving, uh, moving forward. There has been a kind of a constant uh, set of attacks and criticisms, and in some cases insults, right? Uh, contra and where the alliance seems to be seen as a burden rather than a benefit, and it has been an enormous benefit to the United States, and an embrace of uh, hostile uh, powers in the, in the world. The contrast is sharp. It was really sharp on the last trip, obviously, that the president took when he went to NATO and then went on to, on to Helsinki. You mentioned, Nick, the, this, the, 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 on, on NATO, this interview that the president gave Tucker Carlson where he uh, said he doubted um, or had questions about Article 5, which is the core provision of the NATO, the Washington Treaty, which means that uh, anyone, an attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, and in particular, talking in some, you had some story about uh, you know, Montenegro. This caused a real reaction around the world. It caused a real reaction in our country. Bipartisan majorities of the Congress, particularly in the Senate, went ahead and passed legislation saying that the United States would not pull back, and they're probably passing more legislation uh, from NATO without a supermajority in the Congress. So it was, it was a really kind of a striking thing. No president of the United States has said that since the Treaty of Washington was signed in 1949. Uh, so it was a disruption, right? It really kind of an un The next point I'd make, and I'll finish up in the last two here, there is an inexplicable approach to Russia. At least it's been unexplained right, by the president, I think, to this date. Um, and he seems quite disconnected from his advisors, who I think have, and they, uh, in, the, in the briefing room in the White House yesterday, were quite direct with respect to the threat from Russia, particularly on the, elec on the election threat coming into this year. But he has an inexplicable, at least to this day, unexplained uh, view uh, on Russia. And it has been, um, you know, quite concerning, I think, to allies. It's been concerning to, uh, 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 Congress has been concerned, I think, national security professionals. You know, it's interesting on the, this whole Russia thing. I was thinking about this morning. So I co-chaired the Clinton transition uh, in, 19, in 2016 uh, and was working on putting together the national security set of recommendations to Secretary Clinton uh, for the entire national security team, as you know, right? You were on our team, right? Um, I was working for, had the privilege of working for a person that everybody in the world thought was going to be president of the United States. I never had any Russians knocking at my door, right? It was kind of a, it's been a, it's, a, it's an odd episode, and I would assess that as really kind of a real effort by the Russians to run at and run, pro, run programs, active measures here, and run particularly at the Trump, uh, at the Trump, or, at the Trump organization. It's, it's, a, it's inexplained, it's unexplained to date, and I think quite concerning. But the last point I want to make is this, is that you know, probably the most important trend in the world, I think, um, right now, has been the reemergence, and I think we all agree on this, of great power um, competition, some places conflict, um, uh, that, and it's a change, obviously, from the post-Cold War setting, where eventually, essentially, the great powers were engaged in cooperative and productive um, projects together. And there's been a change. I think you can, and there's a lot to, there's a lot of reasons for this. 
It has a lot to do with uh, uh, Vladimir Putin returning to the presidency of Ru the Russian Federation in the spring of 2012. It has a lot to do with the fact, by the fact that we're in a much more competitive phase with China. But it's not just geopolitical, although it is geopolitical, it's also ideological. You know, Frank Fukuyama, whom everybody here knows reasonably well, wrote a famous, maybe the most famous piece after, you know, along with the Class of Civilizations by Sam Huntington. I have to give the Harvard crowd their, their due there. But, the, uh, but Fukuyama's piece, of course, The End of History, argued that, the, that basically the, the liberal Western system had won that this is the way in which uh, countries are going to be governed going forward. This, we had found kind of the right mix for how to govern societies. And of course, that period didn't last very long, right? It lasted a quarter of a century. Uh, that's not the case, right? And we have real competition now. And the reason I, I raise this is, 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 is as concern about President Trump. There's a phrase that's been in, in um, history and foreign policy and national security in the United States called, and the phrase is the leader of the free world. Uh, and the United States was looked to lead a group of democracies that had shared values and would push back against different forces in the, uh, in the world. That's the question on the table right now. We have pressure, I think, from Russia, where Putin believes he's leading, I think, an international effort here of uh, illiberal, anti-democratic effort. We have pressure on the other side from China, where the Chinese have put on display and for offer a full alternative model. Uh, and we are in a competition here, and it needs the United States at the center. And the question that's presented here given the president's performance to date, is where is he on that role? Uh, is he on the Putin, um, more radical authoritarian parties? And we're not at peak populism either in Europe. We can talk about that, right? Uh, uh, right through, is there a line going from, from Moscow to, the, to, to Washington? Or is he willing to step into this at a time when it is really needed to defend our values and to defend the system that has been enormously beneficial to us? That's the real question, I think, kind of the macro question on the table. So Tom, before we go to Condi and Steve, who will provide their own uh, perspective on this. You just mentioned at the very end, we're not at peak populism in Europe. I was really struck this summer at the fear in Western Europe and the democratic governments of Western Europe that there being, there's a cancer from within. They're battling their populist parties, but you now have four governments in Europe taken over by these. Uh, what should, what would you have recommended had you been national security advisor now? What should the president be doing? We can't save Europe. They have to save themselves and preserve their own democracies. What's the role of the American um, president here? The U.S. president has a big role, I think, in Europe, including supporting those parties and individuals and leaders with whom we have close relationships in their efforts to continue a democratic, um, you know, um, capitalist um, uh, uh, approach which preserves those institutions in Europe like NATO and the European Union. We need to be behind that, right? And instead, we have elements of this administration, including sometimes the president, who actually are hostile to those institutions. And that is absolutely in line with Russian and before that Soviet national security strategic goals. And it's, it's, it's consistent with the goals of a number of these uh, radical parties and individuals in Europe. Uh, you know, the, so the storyline was that as Europe will re recovered economically, Macron held the center in France, uh, and there would be a reaction to some extent to it, uh, President Trump's approach and that populism would peak. That did not happen, as you laid out, right, uh, in Italy and in, uh, in Sweden and in Austria, right? You know, I mean, even Macron. Macron's election was really a repudiation. It was anti-establishment repudiation of the existing order in France. So it hasn't peaked. And the last thing I'll say on this is, and the reasons for it have not gone away. It's a, a, a disappointment in the performance of government. Uh, it's, uh, in the United States, inequality. It's fast uh, technological and cultural trends. And it's a lot about technology. Uh, and we can discuss that later. So we're not at peak populism. I think the United States and the president should be taking a much more uh, visible role as the head of those uh, democracies and those individuals and parties which um, protect our interests. Tom mentioned um, Brent Scowcroft, who co-chaired the Aspen Strategy Group with Joe Nye. When Brent became chairman emeritus, Condoleezza Rice became co-chair. So Condi and Joe. Um, are our co-chairs, our leaders, and Condi, thank you for taking that on. And your views on, is it a revolution in American foreign policy? Is it just sectoral change? How serious is it? What do you agree or disagree with? I think it's an evolution in American foreign policy. And I think unless we recognize that, we're going to misread the reason for that evolution. Uh, uh, President Trump and the populism in Europe uh, didn't emerge from the head of Medusa, okay? It didn't sort of just come out of nowhere. These trends have been developing for a while. Let me just take two issues and then maybe Steve can pick up on others. 
If you take the issue of trade, I am an unabashed free trader. I believe fundamentally in the system that the United States created after World War II, along with its allies, which saw the international economy as a positive sum game, not zero sum game. The United States probably had 50, 60 percent of the world's GDP, didn't try to protect it, uh, intended for there to be other powerful economies because that was going to make everybody richer. That worked extraordinarily well. And in fact, the reason that we can talk today about investment in Poland or Ukraine or even Russia for that matter, or investment in China, is that that economic system was a powerful draw to countries once they decided to try to improve their economic conditions, whether it was China and Deng Xiaoping or the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I'm an unabashed supporter of that. But we have to recognize that the criticism of that system has been growing for quite a long time from the quarters that Tom mentioned at the end of his remarks, people who didn't really benefit from that system. I sometimes feel that those of us who believe in globalization and, uh, and economic integration are a little bit like people who are talking to someone who doesn't speak your language. So if I'm talking to someone who speaks only Chinese, my tendency is to talk louder and slower, and they will somehow understand us. That's the way we're, we're talking about free trade and globalization today. If we talk louder and slower, to the unemployed uh, coal miner in West Virginia or to the unemployed steel worker in Northern Britain, they will finally get that globalization was good for them. And so unless we see that this was evolving for some time, let's remember that the Trans-Pacific Partnership wasn't even supported in the 2016 election by the Secretary of State who helped to negotiate it, Hillary Clinton. She walked away from it. That should tell you something about the underlying discomfort with global integration and, and trade. So when I say, um, what is the president doing on trade? And let me just take trade. Um, I think he may well be someone who is convicted, whose own personal conviction is that the United States has been disadvantaged by free trade agreements. I don't agree with that. So far, we, are, we have not seen a blowing up of the trade system. We've seen some uh, back and forth on tariffs, but we continue to negotiate on, NARIF, on, NATO, which, uh, pardon me, on uh, NAFTA, which, by the way, is a fact, not a treaty. Uh, on the day after 9-11, Steve will remember, uh, we closed the border with, China, uh, with, um, with Canada, and within three days, nobody could make a car because the supply chain was in Canada. So NAFTA is a fact, and I think one of the reasons that you may have seen negotiation and negotiation and negotiation on NAFTA rather than ripping up what he called the worst trade agreement, I think, in human history, is that some of those facts are beginning now to, to settle in. So how do you approach this? Well, you have to recognize that something about the global economy has produced a reaction to it that has to be dealt with. And I think it comes to skills. I think it comes to job skills mismatches. I think it comes to the role of technology. And unless we do that, and if we just keep saying, well, it's because Donald Trump is a protectionist, uh, we're actually never going to rebuild a consensus on free trade. So I would make that first point. Just remember, it's evolution. Hillary Clinton didn't support the Trans-Pacific Partnership. When we look at something um, like the issue of immigration. I am unabashedly a believer in immigration as the bedrock and, in fact, the most important factor in America's greatness, right? That we the people was uh, not a closed concept, that somebody could come here to make $5, not 50 cents, and within a generation, their kids had finished college, and within another generation, their kids were running for office in the United States. I think that's a terrific story. Sergey Brin's parents bring him here. <laughs> Sergey Brin's parents bring him here when he's seven years old from Russia. He founds Google, would never have found it in Russia. So at the high end, at the low end, immigration has been terrific. But remember, we have failed administration after administration to get comprehensive immigration reform. And maybe we wouldn't be in this mess if we'd gotten comprehensive immigration reform. And George W. Bush, 
along with John McCain, John Kyle, and Teddy Kennedy, had an immigration reform bill in 2008 that failed for one vote. And so again, these are problems that have been building up for some time, and if we just focus on the current situation with the administration, we're not gonna get to the bottom of how we actually rebuild some of the consensus for policies that I am an unabashed supporter of. Uh, you know that I am a major believer in democracy. Um, I think that the democratic piece is observable. Democracies don't fight one another. Um, I also think that authoritarian envy uh, doesn't take account of the fact that authoritarians uh, are efficient at bad policy, uh, like the one-child policy in China, which now uh, has 34 million Chinese men without mates. It was very efficiently carried out. But when you have a single point of failure at the top in an authoritarian system, you get bad decisions, and oh, by the way, you can't change power peacefully, and oh, by the way, uh, people stay too long, which is why you have too many presidents for life. So I'm an unabashed supporter of democracy. But as Tom said, we're having problems in democracies delivering. And I have to admit, as a member of the Bush administration, that somehow democracy support became associated with Iraq and Afghanistan which were actually security issues, and then later on the question was, after you've overthrown dictators, what do you do with the government? Democracy support is also what we did in Liberia, where we ended the Civil War and helped Ellen Johnson Sirleaf to stabilize that country. Democracy support is election uh, support in any number of countries, and so on and so on. And so maybe one of the reasons that it's easy to, uh, to finger democracy and support and say it's never worked, those people are never gonna get it, why are we spending our money doing this, is that we haven't really defended it in the right way. So, just to sum up, I think this is an evolution, not a revolution. The president is different, uh, he is after all. Uh, the first president we've had whose first job in government was president of the United States. <laughs> and so, it's different. But let's not deceive ourselves that this is somehow just about Donald Trump, the erosion that we're seeing in the system of the last 70 plus years is a longer story. Thank you, Condi. Um, <laughs> so, and, and with Steve's forbearance, I just wanted to ask, I have to ask you, you spent a lot of your life, including in Colorado, yeah. studying Russia. Yes. That press conference in Helsinki, um, and let me put it this way. The president was out, he did a, um, camp, a, a rally in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania last night. And he said, look, I did great. I'm just paraphrasing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did great. He said, I, I wanted to be diplomatic. Why can't we be diplomatic? I would say as a diplomat, yeah. being diplomatic doesn't mean you can't be critical. Yeah, cool. On issue I, after issue, I mean, explain, what would you say to him now if he I, called I, well, you up? How should he handle yeah, this? Look, uh, uh, you know I food? have nothing great to say about Vladimir Putin, right? He, he once liked me, doesn't so much like me anymore. But <laughs> it is really hard standing next to another leader to suddenly be critical of him. I get that. Remember looking into somebody's eyes and seeing a soul, okay? So <laughs> it's hard, it's hard. There is no doubt he, he made a mistake. He should not have, the, the press conference was a mistake. The, the statement that they had made, that he, they'd written, was a really good statement. Stick to the statement, find a way not to get going and, and, and uh, temporizing, and that's what happened. Uh, I will say this, I think that uh, the summit itself, I, you know, none of us know for certain what happened for two hours, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but when people say we don't know what happened, we, there was actually a, an American translator. I'm quite sure that she was the note taker in that meeting. And so I assume that Mike Pompeo and others are working through whatever happened in that room. But yeah, it was a, what would I say to the president? I would say, Mr. President, Vladimir Putin has two speeds, or let me say two modes, humiliate or dominate. Respect isn't among them. So don't be confused about that. 
Now, Steve, you have a choice. You can say you agree with everything that's been said. <laughs> or you could say, help us understand uh, President Trump. What is he trying to achieve? What does he think his three or four major policy initiatives are? Where does he want to be in two or three years? Well, as you uh, all know, all the world is increasingly divided among those who attack Trump and those who defend Trump. And those few of us who are in the center trying to do neither, it, it, it's a little bit of a lonely job. So what we end up doing is trying to explain Trump, which is a little difficult since I wasn't in his campaign, I wasn't in his transition, I wasn't in his administration, and I've never met Donald Trump. So why should you listen to me? And with that, I'm going to leave. No, just kidding. Uh, uh, so th the first thing you have to remember is he was elected to be a disruptor. This is the first time a political insurgency and a, and a political populist, populist actually got elected president of the United States. It's never happened before. And it was because a good chunk of Americans felt that they had been victimized by globalization, threatened by immigration, abandoned by their politicians, and betrayed by the elites, like some of us. And that resulted in the election of Donald Trump. So he was elected to be a disruptor. If you talk to people who vote for him, they said, you know, we want him to disrupt the system and maybe turn it over. And he is doing it. Now, it also happens to be his temperament. So there's a wonderful marriage here. But he's taken a number of issues, and he's really trying to reset the table on those issues, whether it's North Korea, Iran, trade, you name it. Resetting the table. That's been the, the business of the first year and a half. I think the business of the rest of this year is going to be trying, on his part, to mobilize his base so that he holds the House of Representatives. And the real question is, what will Trump, Donald Trump be in the third year of his administration? Is he resetting the table so he can really try to close some deals and accomplish some strategic redirection for the country? Or is this man who's going to spend four years being disruptor in chief because that's the only thing he knows? Uh, I don't know. And I think the jury is out. I would give you two things to think about as you think about President Trump. My wife said after he's elected, you know, he's a business guy and he thinks when you acquire a company, you get to run the company. And he thought when he was elected president, he got to run the country. But he's learning that that's not how it works. And he is pressing the constitutional limits. He is, he is uh, pushing the edge of the envelope. And the interesting thing is the noise you hear coming out of Washington is not the system breaking, it's the system working. And he is being checked by the judiciary, he's being checked by the federal system, there are state attorney generals that are suing the federal government, he is being checked by business leaders, civic leaders, uh, he's being increasingly checked by the Congress of the United States, putting limits, this is the system working as it was designed to do. Second of all, think about as you think about Trump, we are all focused on what he says. And I would submit that's exactly what he wants. This is a man who cared, spent his whole life trying to be a celebrity. And he, he, he wants to have all eyes on him. And all eyes are on him 24 seven. And he uses that to drive the discussion by one by many times outrageous and sometimes not factually accurate statements. <laughs> We're being delicate here. <laughs> but there's a method to his madness because he dominates the discussion when it goes wrong in a bad direction. He comes out with another step at a statement and all the press runs to his new statement. I would suggest we start focusing on what he is doing. <laughs> Quickly, four things. Yes, he said a lot of things about NATO he should not have said. But 
we on this dais and others for two decades have been pushing the allies in Europe to spend more on defense. He's actually getting them to do it. And in the end of the day, he is being checked by the Congress in terms of his ability to walk away from NATO. Um, trade, um, he is, I think, generating, I think whether President, Cl whether Secretary Clinton had been elected president or President Trump, we were gonna have to address the trade imbalances with China. Whether it was Republicans or Democrats, there's bipartisan agreement about that. And we'll see whether he is able to accomplish uh, uh, that. And finally, uh, on this talk versus action, I thought it was very interesting. After the G7 summit and the NATO summit, everybody thought the president has destroyed our relationships with Europe largely over trade. And last week, very interesting, the person who heads the institution that Donald Trump likes least of all in Europe, the European Commission, comes to Washington and gets a trade deal, at least the outlines of a trade deal, which would say no tariffs, no non-tariff barriers, and no subsidies. If we could deliver on that, that would be a very good thing indeed. So Steve, <laughs> let me, um, everybody gets a follow-up. Here's, here's your follow-up question. It's about NATO. I get that the president's actions are important. I mean, they're very important. But what he says is also important, and in diplomacy especially so. On 9-11, I had just arrived, as Condi and Steve will remember, as ambassador to NATO. And early the next morning, I called Condi, woke her up in the middle of the night, and said, the Allies want to invoke Article 5. They had come en masse to us. And we hadn't even declared it was Osama bin Laden at that point who had attacked us. And all of them voted to invoke Article 5 on the morning of the 12th. They all went into Afghanistan with us, as we all know. The five of us know that. They're still there with us. Do you remember, Condi, what you, when we were talking on the phone, what you said to me that morning about Allies? It's good you, to have friends. It's good to have friends in the world. So here's what President Trump said two weeks ago in an interview on Fox News. He said he wasn't sure that, as a, I'm paraphrasing, as American president, he would back up Article 5 for Montenegro, the newest and smallest member of NATO that was the victim of a Russian-inspired coup d'etat two years ago. Words matter. And I would submit that what the president has done with NATO is depreciate the quality of the American commitment as no other president has done. I think there's a risk of that. I think the problem, you know, when we dealt, all dealt with the Israelis, one of the things we, we had a problem with was they, they were insensitive to the multiple audience problem because Israeli leaders spoke usually to Israeli domestic politics. Trump has the same problem. President Trump has the same problem in my view. He's only speaking to his base and he has not understood how much his words matter by changing the politics in other countries that actually can help end up defeating objectives he wants to pursue. This is the concern we all had about Mexico. The, the denigration he made of the Mex Mexicans would uh, in fact elect a populist in Mexico who probably has very, may have less interest in uh, doing a new NAFTA agreement than the president would hope. So these words do matter, and I think it's a price. I think the thing Tom said that I'm most worried about is does he understand he has a role as the leader of the free world standing up for principles of freedom and democracy? And that is both a function of what he does, but also a function of what he says. And the thing I think I worry most about is that he does not really appreciate or want to undertake that role. That is a real problem. Uh, I would agree with the, the last statement that Steve made, but I just want to get to this words matter. Yes, words matter, but facts on the ground matter too. And if you look at, uh, you know, we, there's a reason that we always, in order to have extended deterrence for Europe, we didn't just depend on what the American president said. We put American soldiers on the ground who would be a tripwire if the Russians got confused about whether the American president was committed to Article 5. And in fact, in NATO, we have strengthened, starting in the Obama administration, our posture in ways that I think it would be foolhardy of Vladimir Putin to worry just about what the president said. So facts on the ground matter. Second fact on the ground that mattered, Lopez Obrador in Mexico. Worried a lot about 
him because we know that he, or even many Mexicans, think he's kind of Chavez light. And do you really want Chavez light on your border? But it's kind of interesting that one of the first things that he said was that he wasn't going to go after NAFTA. Why? Because the Mexican economy has actually been very well served by NAFTA. So yes, I think what the president says matters. I wish he would not say some of the things he said. I wish he would stop tweeting, so forth and so on. But facts on the ground matter too, and it's one reason that what you do uh, does matter as much as what you say. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, we could go on for hours here, and we will. We're going to come back and invite you all to ask questions, and feel free to ask any of the panelists questions on this issue, this big issue of the Trump, I would say, revolution, evolution in American foreign policy. I want to ask this panel. Just, just 10 seconds on what Steve said, though. Just literally 10 seconds. And I then would, I'm going to give Susan 10 seconds I know. then. I would All right. I, I, I'm not, well, you know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I, I, would, I would be careful about ascribing a unified field theory to everything that Donald Trump is doing every day. I, I, All right. I, no, don't, I, think think I, I, I don't think I did. I don't think I did. Susan, do you have 10 seconds? The words of the President of the United States matter enormously. Yes, facts are on the ground. but. Words become facts when they come out of the mouth of the president, and truth matters. When the president of the United States doesn't tell the truth, that matters. Okay, we're going to come back to this issue. Um, I, wanted, um, I wanted to ask one more question, and maybe we'll go through this briefly. I know that Connie and Tom, especially Susan and Steve, have something to say about this. The subject for us this weekend is a huge subject. And that is, will we as a society retain this technological edge that has powered us as the strongest country in the world for 75 years since the Second World War? Walter, who's written a paper for us this weekend, says there is an innovation triangle from the Second World War all the way through to the current day of government, the private sector, and our university labs, a virtuous triangle that produced the seed corn. I'm praising you, Walter that produced the seed corn, that produced this fantastic economy and the scientific innovations that has powered us forward. And you say in your paper, I'm just going to give advance notice for your paper that you're giving to us on Monday, we're at risk because we're underfunding, underfunding basic science research. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs has said the same thing. Eric Lander, the director of the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT, has said the same thing. We're on the margins of losing this perhaps to China. I think that's a big subject for this weekend. I know, Condi, you've thought, you were provost for nine years at Stanford. That's a tech university. How do you see it? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, American innovation and our lead ha has been driven by the extraordinary cooperation uh, between the government, great universities, and the private sector. Um, some of it was uh, that the government was willing to fund things that had no uh, obvious application, so basic uh, or fundamental research, as it's now called. And I worry about the underfunding of NSF, for instance, National Science Foundation. Now, we are funding the National Endowment for, uh, we are in, we're funding the uh, National Institutes of Health. And my minister says that's because we baby boomers are determined to do something about that 100% death rate. <laughs> so we are absolutely funding research in that area. But when it comes to uh, NSF and energy and even Defense Department funding for basic research, I think we are uh, at risk. And um, I, I will bet on us anyway because I know, again, you know, authoritarian envy, I know that the Chinese have set out these great goals of surpassing us in quantum computing and in uh, AI and in all of these areas. And, you know, maybe they'll get there. But, uh, you know, a, a government that's so terrified of its people that it's trying to hunt down every last human rights advocate on any internet and therefore using AI to get, um, to get uh, uh, scores for, uh, what were they calling them? They're calling them scores for whether or not you're favorable to the Communist Party, so patriotism scores. Uh, that's wasting a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, so I am not so frightened of China. I don't worry that we'll, quote, lose our lead to somebody else, but I do worry that our ability to innovate, innovate quickly, commercialize from that innovation, that that could erode if we lose that virtuous triangle, as Walter has, has called it. And one other thing, I hope that our fear of China doesn't lead us to try to out-China China. China. 
Uh, I've been concerned about some of the things that have been suggested. For instance, um, at every great university, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, um, Chinese students are coming to be research, uh, to research programs. And there are those who would like us to say, uh, in AI, for instance, if you're a Chinese student, you can't be in certain labs that are doing AI. All right, if you want to do classified research, that's fine. Then you get to make the, dis the uh, demand that there can only be American citizens doing that. But universities should not be in the position of having a national test, a nationality test for its students. You admit that student, that student's a part of the university. Thank you. Tom. I agree with uh, everything Condi just said, but on the, so we have a significant challenge from China with respect to technology. Indeed, you know, the, the conversation publicly has been about the bilateral trade deficit and tariffs and retaliation by China. Uh, and that's, you know, that'll go back and forth and uh, can do some damage, but that's not the real game. Uh, the real game is, 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 is China's efforts uh, to take the commanding heights of the technologies and the industries of the future, and whether or not they are doing it in a fair, uh, in a fair way, that really is the game here. I think, that, and so, and all that's important, by the way. Um, uh, IP protection and um, reciprocity and forced transfer of technology. If you're a company that wants to come in and do business uh, in China, cyber theft of intellectual property, uh, covert theft of intellectual property in the United States. Those are all very real issues. But that has been the overwhelming focus of our efforts. And, you know, and I would uh, strongly support that, but only as one piece of it. That's, that's, that might not even be half of it. Right? So we need to do all the things that we, that, we, that, we, that we talk about in terms of trying to change Chinese practice. But it can't just be about stopping China from doing the things that they're doing. It has to be, as, as Secretary Rice was talking about, um, do, what are we doing on this side of it? And, the, and so the discussion is really unbalanced right now, frankly. Uh, you know, and um, what there should be, and this is not original with me, it's a lot of the commentary, including the great paper that, that Walter put together and others, this should be, rather than a, us thinking defensively and narrow about trying to change behavior, it should be about uh, our own kind of Sputnik moment here. Uh, you know what are what are we going to do to kind of to meet this uh, to meet this challenge? You know, if you look back on Sputnik. You know, so in 1957 this event happens. Within the first six months after that, Lyndon Johnson had six months of hearings, 75 experts in the Senate, in the Senate yeah. Armed Services Committee, thousands of pages of uh, of testimony taken. Within a year, that was in October 1957. By October 1958, NASA was formed. And we had dramatically increased funding for the National Science Foundation. And we were about a math and science uh, education renaissance in the United States. And we really were putting in place really kind of the foundation of the technological lead, which has made us enormously prosperous uh, since then. It was built on the innovation triangle that Walter talks about. The Vannevar Bush put in a famous paper, Science, the Endless Frontier, right, uh, about the role of the, the government on basic research, universities, and commercial, uh, commercial operations. Uh, so that's the, that's the model, I think. So what should we do? And we're not talking about that, frankly. Uh, we have had a, a, really since the 70s, a decline in federal R&D spending in the United States. It's down to below 1% right now of our federal, of our federal budget. Um, and not to get partisan about this, but you know, Fed, uh, President Trump's initial budget this year, which luckily got revised in an omnibus bill, had the, uh, the biggest reductions in R&D in 40 years. Right, you know, so uh, this is not the direction that we should be that we should be going. What should we do? I'll just lay off two or three things and then, and then be quiet. One, I think we do need to have a national innovation strategy in the United States. Two, it needs to be adequately funded. Um, we need to identify our priorities and make sure that we're doing the kind of the research that Condi talked about, which is not the stuff that's going to pay off and commercialize and go to market quickly next year, but but multiple year. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's, um, Marianne Mazzacuto uh, wrote a book called The Entrepreneurial State. There's a fantastic chart. If you ever take a look at this book, The Entrepreneurial State, there's a fantastic chart, and it's a diagram of the iPhone. And it has a line from each of the key technologies in the iPhone, and it traces them to a government research program over the last 30 years. It's, it, it's really an incredible reminder of just how terrific this uh, thing is when it, uh, when it works. So what should we do? So an innovation strategy, uh, fund it, uh, bring science back to the center of public policy. There's been, you know, we, we, we don't even have a, a science advisor in the White House right now. Um, I think that's, and, 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 and work this. Uh, four, anticipate, really start to work on anticipating what's gonna come out of these technologies. 
you know, Condi talked about, you know, the impact of technology ultimately on the labor markets. We have huge issues around ethics and how we, how we and start to get, not be a victim of this or on the defense all the time, but, but start to get ahead of this as a, uh, as a country. Uh, fifth, um, infrastructure, right, which we have not done uh, in this country, right? The American Society of Civil Engineers gives us a D minus, or D plus, sorry, on our infrastructure in the United States. Uh, STEM uh, education, um, and last, as Connie was saying, we need to bring in the best and the brightest from around the world to work at our, and work at our, and work at our company. So really, we just spent $2 trillion really in a tax expenditure uh, and, a, and a stimulus expenditure, right? We didn't spend a penny on this uh, kind of stuff, right, uh, in, in, a, in a really kind of focused way. Some increase in some of the, in, the kinds of NIH, but we really haven't really kind of focused this in, an, in, in the way it, it needs to be. And that's the other half of it. It's just not trade and tariffs, right? It's about what we're going to do as a country to meet the challenge. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Susan and Steve. I'll be very brief. I agree with virtually everything that both that Tom and Condi have said, but I would just add on the uh, on the commercial side uh, of innovation, um, in, separate from the academy, where I absolutely agree, our immigration policies matter enormously. We are not going to get where we need to be to be f as fully competitive as we possibly can with the kinds of immigration policies that we're currently pursuing. And the other thing is free trade matters. Having open, you know, free trading systems when we're not, uh, you know, actively penalizing our partners or even our, our competitors um, is, is an, another critical element to um, our uh, technological edge. What we haven't talked about yet and what we will talk about in our session is, you know, what does this look like narrowly within the national security realm? And there, I'm frankly less optimistic than, um, the, than the tone, I think, that, that uh, Tom and Condi have set, in part because much of the innovation that will matter in defense technology, et cetera, is coming out of uh, the tech sector, Silicon Valley and elsewhere, where there's a great reluctance, if not aversion, to replicating the kind of partnership that we had traditionally during the Cold War and beyond between the government and the defense sector and, uh, and academia. So we, we kind of have three isolated elements that are not lashed up. And to the extent that there is a backlash in places like Google over pretty simple stuff like drone technology, uh, wait till it becomes something much more serious. And if we can't harness that know-how, we, the, the, the government, harness that know-how for um, our defense edge, then we're going to be in trouble. That's a key question for us this weekend, Susan. Thank you. Steve. Just two points. One, uh, I agree with the sentiment. We should be s setting a strategy for what the United States needs to do to revitalize its own institutions and provide for the security and welfare and prosperity of its people. If we do that, if we get that right and get our institutions go in that direction, we will have a platform to deal with the future, whether it's the rise of China, whether it's a, a spoiler in Russia. So I think that is the folks. Let's focus on what we need to do for the good of our people. Second issue, I think the most difficult trade issue we're going to have with China, and I don't know how you solve it, is what Xi Jinping has said very explicitly. This initiative, they want to dominate the key technologies of the 21st century, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's bio uh, bioengineering, whether it is nanotechnology, you name it. And he's said it explicitly. And he had a wonderful statement. He said, if you, in terms of information technology, if you build your future on information technology from other countries, you build your future on sand. Well, that's true for us, too. And the worry is through industrial policy, China will preserve its market, give its market as a base for its companies to develop technologies which they unleash on the world and destroy uh, the industries of other countries like they did in some sense uh, with solar panels and also with steel. We can't permit that. Um, these technologies are too important for our economy in the 21st century and they're too important for our military. On the other hand, if you talk to people, American companies who are developing 5G, they will tell you they need access 
to the Chinese market for to make the economics work. And also, they need access in the market to be the dominant player, so they can, we can also be, have a hand in setting the standards. And secondly, I understand it, and Connie's a better witness, Silicon Valley and China are very interconnected in terms of investment and development in these new technologies. If we pull them apart, it'll be highly costly to both of us. Uh, so the trick here is, can we find a way that we can both cooperate in these technologies but recognize the competitive aspects and make sure that the resulting technologies are available to all of us because the entire world community is going to need these technologies in the 21st century. Uh, that's a tall order and I, I think this is the area where I don't quite see a way forward. Thank you, Steve. So we'll spend the next three days looking at this. We have representatives from the Trump administration with us from uh, industry from Silicon Valley and from other parts of the United States. Two former governors, two members of the U.S. Senate. It's going to be a good weekend. A lot of challenges. Now the floor is open to questions. On this set of issues, on the first set of issues, it's only right uh, if the mic can come forward this way to the front row that we call on our co-chair, Professor Joe Nye, Harvard University. Thank you, Nick. And I'd like to go back to um, Steve's point about disruption. Uh, those of us who are in the foreign policy and national security community uh, obviously feel offended by Trump's style. It's not, as Nick said, it's not a diplomatic style. But suppose that if you go back and read The Art of the Deal, and it, where he talks about insulting and coercing a bargaining partner and then doing the deal because you get a better deal. Suppose that's a real strategy for what he's doing. So the disruption is not just bad manners. Suppose it is a strategy. Imagine now that it's 2020 and what we see is regime change in Iran. What we see is that China has made concessions not on the overall balance, which is irrelevant, but on coerced technology transfer, which is what we were just talking about. And imagine third, that most NATO partners are now spending above 2% of GDP on defense. Will Trump then be regarded as a successful foreign policy president on the eve of the 2020 election? Thank you, Professor Nye for challenging the panel. <laughs> Joe, was, was uh, that intended, are we supposed to actually respond to that, or? <laughs> how, would, how would you draw the balance? No, look, I, 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 let me dive in the water here. Um, I, I think that it is entirely possible that the president has taken from his own experiences in business a playbook for how he wants to be president. We would all do that. Whatever we're experienced, we would bring it along. And it is entirely possible that it will have some successes. I think it will have some successes on NATO defense spending, um, and he will manage to shame them into doing that. Um, I don't know how uh, about the Chinese, but the Chinese are beginning to see the limits, actually, of just a trade war with us uh, as they begin to have troubles in their own currency, is getting capital flight. So... And, uh, you know, the Iranians have their own problems. But I will say this. The difference is the other guy doesn't have to make a deal, right? Uh, the other countries will react. They will react in accordance with their own interests, their own domestic audiences, their own ideologies. And so I don't think it's going to be a one-for-one. One. I will say, going back to my point about facts on the ground, in places where the facts on the ground favor American power, I think you can play that game. It's going to be harder in places where the facts on the ground don't necessarily favor American power. And the question about China that Steve raised of whether or not they can pull off industrial policy in this way, uh, that's going to be a little bit harder to kind of bully your way uh, to a solution, but I would completely accept that there may be some cases in which this has worked. I, I have to tell you, you know, when he decided to meet with Kim Jong-un, 
my first thought was, oh no, what's he doing? And I thought, you know what, nothing else has worked. Right? So uh, let's, let's give it a try. And so maybe he'll be successful in some of them. I wouldn't rule it out. Others? Anybody else? Okay, Professor Nye. <laughs> You got, your, you got your answer I, on, the, on the test. Nick, Nick, I'll just say one thing. Right. The problem of that is if you squeeze somebody, you get your deal, you walk away and you never deal with them again, that's one thing. But particularly with friends and allies, you're gonna be dealing with them over and over again. And the question is how does that style work in that context? And do at some point they just decide we can't really deal with this guy we can't really make deals with him that are gonna stick. I don't know. I would just add, there's a very wise man who sits in the same office building as Condi, 97-year-old uh, George Schultz. And one of his big takeaways from his time, four times cabinet officer, is we need to tend the diplomatic garden, create relationships so that exactly, as Steve has just said, when we need someone, we've treated them with respect and a sense of fairness before we need them. And so, I always love that aspect of George Schultz's no, tenure as Secretary of State. It, it, it is absolutely true, but it goes both ways. And I just have to say one, one word here about our European allies. Um, there can be a tendency among our European allies to lecture the American president. Like me. Yes. Uh, particularly American presidents that they don't think are uh, as urbane as they are. And what I do you have, have in mind? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I have been saying to our European allies, um, I understand that sometimes you feel insulted, uh, but it would be very good if you remember George Schultz's point that tending relationships is important. And you want the relationship with the American president. Uh, try to tend that relationship too. Here's the good news. There are 28 NATO allies by 2024 24 of them will be spending the baseline mainly for two reasons. One is Vladimir Putin's invasion of Crimea. All NATO budgets went up in 2014. Exactly. Second is yeah. Donald Trump. Yeah. He's pushed him. Yeah. So fair enough. Two people responsible for this. Susan. I think there are three because it was in 2014 under President Obama's leadership that we got the commitment to go to 2% by 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Well, uh, it's important <laughs> to get the fact. I mean, it, it's, you know, between 2014 and 2018, uh, there was significant increase each year, right? And in total, almost 85 billion dollars. So there's been there's a, there's a there's a trend here on this issue, though. On um, that Joe asked about in terms of the kind of statecraft here, and um, uh, you know, the um, you do need people over the long term, right, uh, for you in terms of your uh, in terms of your priorities, uh, and the word priorities is really important too. Um, you know, so. You have to think in the world about, you know, what are, the, what are the most important things we're trying to get done today? And if the most important thing we're trying to get done today is to adjust the trade relationship with China, but more importantly, as you said, adjust Chinese practices on technology, um, it doesn't make sense to have fights with everybody in the world at the same time, right? You know, and so that is, that's an important aspect of this, I think, too, uh, is to think hard about what your priorities are and what assets you can bring to bear to get the best outcome uh, for, the, uh, for the country. And right now, we're, um, we're in too many disputes in too many places, I think, in order to kind of bring the kind of resources and leverage we can bring to bear to solve the big problems. Susan. Two leaders did more, bent over backwards to try to be nice to Donald Trump from day one. Abe and uh, Trudeau. And never said or did anything uh, that could be remotely deemed as, as talking down to him or um, being, you know, condescending or patronizing. They were repaid in the case of Abe with uh, you know, the earliest and some of the toughest tariffs despite his pleas, the withdrawal from TPP, et cetera. Um, and despite all the golf diplomacy that they've done together, it, it on the economic front has yielded pain for uh, Japan. And then we all saw recently what happened at the G7 um, where uh, you know, Trudeau was uh, standing up for Canada's fundamental interests and not being tarred with steel and aluminum tariffs on national security grounds. And the fact that he held his ground after all this time in the face of the tariffs, you know, led to the onslaught that we saw I, I subsequently. Don't, I, don't be misunderstood. I didn't say be nice to the president. That's not what I said. 
I said, remember that you want a relationship with the United States of America, and so be careful how you deal with the American president. And I'm sorry, I've been through it. I've been through the lectures to the American president about how he didn't understand climate change. And we slowly rebuilt that relationship over a period of time because he was willing. But uh, this, this is a two-way street. OK. Jane Harmon. OK, brilliant panel. Um, just an observation about the spirit underlying Joe's uh, question and then a question. Uh, I think what Joe was saying, and certainly I would say, and I think we would all agree uh, as Aspen Strategy Group members, uh, what we want to focus on is helping our country succeed, not helping Trump fail. He may fail, but the goal is in the next two years or however long it may be, two months, eight, six years, uh, to make America uh, the best we can be. I didn't say make America great again. <laughs> um, so my question is on the second part of what you were asking about, Nick, and that's the uh, technology and innovation. Uh, nobody mentioned an acronym that many uh, secondary uh, schools have been using for two decades, and that is STEM education, science, technology, education, and math. Uh, I, certainly in Southern California, my old district, there were huge local uh, investments in that. And my question is, uh, has it made any difference? Did it fail? Uh, what do we need to do about that? Because kids in, in middle school are the ones who have to fall in love with science and innovation. Uh, yeah, I, I'll take this one because I actually follow it pretty closely. Look, I think we, it is too early uh, really to tell whether the investment um, has succeeded or failed. But I think one thing that we know is that we have not just a general problem with STEM, but we have some groups that are particularly underrepresented in STEM, women and minorities. And I'm f uh, concerned that whatever investment we've made in STEM, and by the way, America's starting to win some of these national math tests and the like, and so maybe the investment's paying off. But I am concerned that it may be paying off unevenly um, if you are in a failing neighborhood school, the chances that you're going to come out with a good STEM education are nearly zero. And it's not just because there's no investment in STEM, it's because the school is lousy. And so you can't just go after STEM in these underserved populations unless you go at the root cause of failing neighborhood schools. And I think the gap is growing not getting smaller in terms of STEM education for underserved uh, kids, and that's what worries me really most. Yes, we have a question right down. The mic is coming to you, if you wouldn't mind waiting for it. Thanks for an excellent conversation. My name is Stephen Keenan. I got to uh, be one of the uh, 17,000 Americans that worked in Iran uh, before the revolution. I'm a used car salesman in the past from Tehran, Iran. I took cars down from Germany and sold them in Iran. So my question is to you, um, do we walk back and say we want to go back into the treaty, but we want to discuss a few things like, you know, your support of terrorism with Hamas and uh, Hezbollah, how would you feel we need to approach this? Because obviously, I was all excited a few days ago. I'm pretty naive um, sometimes. But when the president said, let's have a talk, I called up one of my Iranian friends and said, great, let's have a talk. Where should we have the talk? And he said, it's not the right timing right now. Where, you know, you, you being national security advisors, please share some thoughts of how to help President Trump get back. I think possibly we could do what happened with Korea, but I do think um, it was the two Koreas worried, in my assessment, it was the two Koreas, South and North, worried about Trump, and they got together first, and then we had Singapore. Susan, um, it, I think you're probably the best person to answer this because you were national security advisor when the agreement was made. But could I ask you also to comment on an aspect of this? Secretary Pompeo has gone out with a really tough approach against Iran. 
very specific, the president followed by essentially contradicting Secretary Pompeo. So national security advisors have to deal with this kind of thing in government. Deal with both parts of the problem, the inside the government, but also the, the Iran nuclear deal. Well, I, I obviously was a proponent of the Iran nuclear deal, and I think we made a grave mistake by jettisoning it without an alternative. Um, and the deal was working. The IAEA said it was working. The CIA said it was working. The Defense Department said it was working. Uh, and by working, constraining all of Iran's pathways to a nuclear weapon. Having pulled out of that, at any stage, uh, you know, we could find that Iran ceases adherence to the deal. And with the, the nature of the economic sanctions that the administration is, is reimposing, uh, I think it's going to be very hard for Iran to, uh, to stay in, even if that is its objective uh, or desire with respect to the Europeans. So I think we're in a, you know, we, we traded something for nothing and on a very sensitive and dangerous issue. And meanwhile, uh, we've got partners in the Gulf uh, who are very eager for uh, us not only to press our very legitimate concerns about terrorism, about their missile programs, about their destabilizing behavior throughout the region, but in fact to, I think, far more aggressively confront Iran. So what I'm worried about, quite candidly, is not that you know, we're going to end up you know, in a conversation talking. I, you know, I'm, I'm for conversations in diplomacy, even with adversaries. Um, I don't think that's likely to happen anytime soon for, for obvious reasons. But I'm more worried that we could find ourselves on a slippery slope of our own design, perhaps, into conflict with Iran. And Susan, this issue, and a lot of people beginning to look at it, the president says, Pompeo says one thing on Iran, the president says something completely different. On Russia, the same phenomenon this week. As a, yeah, you're, you're all been national security advisor. This is a tough problem to have, and speaking clearly to the rest of the world. Well, I, I want to focus on, again, on the do rather than the words. Um, and look, I think the issue in some sense got framed wrong. I think the issue got framed up was, was the Iran nuclear deal a good deal when the issue should have been framed do we advance U.S. interests in the current situation by staying in it or getting out? Which I think is a closer question, and we can debate about that. But in terms of what I think the administration is trying to do, they are trying to do three things, really. One, get some kind of arrangement or understanding of Iran, which to address three things. One, what they believe were deficiencies in the Iran nuclear agreement. That is to say, it wasn't of indefinite duration, but some of the provisions lapsed, some inspection-related things. You can decide how important those were to you. How to do something about Iranian activity in the region to destabilize the region, its support for terror, uh, and in some sense, its treatment of its own people, but I think uh, more the, 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 the ones before. And they are trying to get our allies to work with us to put economic pressure on Iran to be willing to reach some understandings. I don't think economic pressure is going to be enough. I think you've actually got to start doing things on the ground to check Iran and its behavior uh, and to try to address some of these other things. You need to have some strategy for dealing with its ballistic missile program, which also needs to be addressed. Um, so I, you know, you, you, we can have a discussion about it, but I, I'd like to go back to something Jane said and Joe said. And, and it's something I said when I got criticized by some of my friends. Why were you helping? from time to time, Tom Donilon and Susan Rice and the Obama administration on things. And my answer was, because we have only one president at a time. And if our president succeeds, the country succeeds, and if the president fails, the country fails. That's the way it ends. And so one of the things I like about the Aspen Strategy Group is getting together on a bipartisan basis and see if we can come up with ideas that actually might help this administration succeed in some of these things. And I would not rule out the possibility that, you know, in 2020, uh, you know, it may look more like what Joe Nye described than maybe what you heard from this panel. On, on Iran, it's, a, it's an important case study because it was a, um, it was a, it was a serious strategic error, right? You know, the, the agreement was in place, it was working. Uh, it was found to have been, as Susan said, in uh, compliance by international authorities and our own, by the way, uh, advisors to President Trump. 
It was never intended to be a transformational agreement. It was always a transactional arms control agreement. It was working in those terms. But there were serious issues outside the four corners of the agreement that Steve just outlined. Uh, and we actually were on the path in the Trump administration, by the way, of having an agreement with the Europeans and perhaps other parties to the deal to having agreement on kind of follow-on agreements and additional pressure, uh, but not letting the Iranians off the hook on the core deal. Uh, that, is a, that, is a, that was a huge error. We actually had a path forward here, and now it's going to be just much more difficult. Uh, and we have the damage with our European allies by now saying, you know, um, we had a deal, it, they were in compliance, now we're going to have you bear the economic brunt of our revisiting the deal. So it was, it's an important case study, I think, from a statecraft perspective. Thank you. Um, questions? Yes, right back here in the fourth row. Uh, hello, my name is Greg Allen, and I'm a former student of uh, Professor Burns. I'm now at the Center for a New American Security, where I work on AI and national security policy. Um, my question is to uh, Secretary Rice, uh, because I'm interested in a Cold War comparison, which I realize is not always the appropriate analogy for considering China. Um, but I was recently handed a report uh, that the CIA declassified on the farewell dossier about how trade deliberalization between the United States and the Soviet Union in advanced technologies was part of the reason that the Soviet Union was doing so well in keeping pace in the military applications of advanced technologies. In other words, our basic R&D was subsidizing their advanced military technology development. Uh, given that there is what appears to be a very concerted and aggressive strategy of technological espionage uh, of China against the United States, and uh, China appears to have very patient policy making uh, when they think about uh, these technologies and their national security strategy. How does that change uh, your view, or does it change your view, about the appropriate levels of cooperation in the academic sector, in the commercial sector, and potentially even the military sector? Greg was a great yeah. student of Joe and I and myself. And you can a, just see it's, it. It's a wonderful question. Uh, first of all, I, I'm going to go back to the Soviet side, but let me just say a word about the cooperation. It actually doesn't change my view on academic um, matters. And that's because I think the highest principle of the academy is openness. Um, I, if there are things that uh, are being done within the walls of the university, I do not think you can have a nationality test for people that you've admitted to the university. I don't think you can have labs sealed from people of different nationalities. I think it will begin to erode the very nature of the academic institution. Now, if you want to do classified research, go and do classified research. And by the way, there are uh, federally funded uh, kind of quasi-academic places that you can do that. For instance, something that used to be called the Stanford Research Institute, it's now SRI. It was actually created for that purpose, so that classified research could be done offshore, off campus. But if you're going to protect the university, I don't think you can have these tests within the university. And I will bet on openness and the free system that uh, ultimately the Chinese, no matter how hard they try with industrial policy, just won't get there. If we do the right things, if we try to out-China China, we're going to lose that battle. Which is why I think all of us believe that focusing on America's strengths in innovation and re revisiting those and funding those fully is really the answer, not keeping five Chinese students out of somebody's lab. Now, I have to say, I've read this report, and I have to laugh. Because the idea that the Soviet Union was technologically sophisticated because of our R&D, if they used our R&D, clearly we sunk them. <laughs> because the level of technological sophistication in the Soviet Union at its collapse was uh, not very good. And indeed, what finally got the Soviets' attention, got Gorbachev's attention and all of those people's attention, uh, was actually their own military saying in a very famous article written by a man named Agarkov, who was the chief of the general staff, that the Americans have made our 40% investment in defense irrelevant because the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, was never about knocking down missiles. It was all about command, control, and information, and they've made us irrelevant and we're now going to have to try to play on a ground that we can't compete on, the technological ground, and they fired him, right? Because they didn't want to hear it. So I'm not concerned um, that we funded the Soviet Union to technological sophistication. And if we do the right things, I'm not 
concerned that we will fund the Chinese to technological sophistication. It doesn't mean, by the way, that we shouldn't go after the Chinese on IP. We should. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't go after the Chinese on stealing technologies through cyber attacks that are aimed directly at those measures. But I think the important thing is to focus on what we can do to strengthen our base, not try and out-Chinese them. Yeah, but you know from what I said earlier, I agree totally with that. But Greg, I do think, though, um, there are serious challenges, and we need to have appropriate export controls and appropriate controls on what China is investing in, in the United yeah. States. We can be open, but we have to be smart as well. Uh, we have serious counterintelligence issues, frankly, here, uh, and that needs to be addressed in a, in a, in a very purposeful in a very purposeful uh, way. And we really need to continue to harden our federal systems. Um, I am very worried about our, our kind of the, the posture we're in on cybersecurity right now, frankly. Um, it was a, you know, again, it's an analytical, I'm not trying to be uh, uh, you know, partisan about this, but the, but, the, but the current White House did away with the cybersecurity coordinator position uh, and the assistant to the president for terrorism and, and counterterrorism and cybersecurity. It is a really big error, frankly. It's a big mistake. It is impossible to do uh, all of government and all of government cybersecurity uh, effort absent being coordinated from the White House. There are too many uh, interested parties, too many different perspectives. Nobody sees the whole thing. Uh, this is a really serious, a really serious problem. So yes, open yeah. but smart. Yeah, I, I agree. Could I just mention on the export controls because that is something I think we learned from in the Cold War. Um, my colleague Anya Manuel, I hope she doesn't mind my saying so, is, is going to have a piece in the Atlantic pretty soon. We have to be smart about export controls, too. We had gotten dumb about export controls with the Soviet Union. We were trying to control things that you could go to Radio Shack and buy. And so the export control system had gotten so elaborate that nobody could actually manage it. Control a few technologies, a few things, and control them absolutely. Don't try to control everything. So we can learn something from that experience. Small, small, small yard, big fence. Right. So we have time for one more question, and let me suggest to the panelists that you use this last question, whatever it is, to say whatever you want to say <laughs> before we leave. <laughs> yes. Right here. Oh, Bill. I'm sorry, Bill. I couldn't see you with the glare. Hi. Bill Nitza. Um, I want to respond to Steve Hadley's challenge for real bipartisan and international cooperation on an issue that affects the world. I want to start with um, Condi Rice's analysis of why Donald Trump won the election. I agree. But, and I agree that American elites in both parties bear significant responsibility for not anticipating and doing a better job of mitigating the impact of globalization and technology on a large part of our population. But that is no excuse for not defending the liberal order at home and abroad. And what we need to do in both parties is to help create opportunity, self-confidence, and hope in communities where those things are in great short supply. But the problem is much worse. If we think we have a jobs problem today, technology is going to make it infinitely worse within the coming decades. And what makes it even worse is our jobs problem is nothing compared to what's going to happen in other countries of the world. Because the old path to development, export-driven development that Japan, Korea, so many other countries pursue, is over. India, for example, will not be able to build its economy on manufacture. Frankly, I don't know how India is going to build its economy. So uh, my plea is this weekend. And this is the question that the they, question should is, they should how, react to. The question is. How do we develop a bipartisan strategy with our partners abroad yeah. to address something that is accelerating way beyond the problem we have today? Thank you, Bill, very much. Perfect question, actually. Maybe beginning with Steve and just coming, Susan, Condi, Tom, that question. Um, I was part of a study at Brookings about the international order both before, during, and after the Trump's election. It was very, and it was established with people like me. It was very interesting to see the change. Before the election, everybody said, we gotta defend the international order. People don't understand, we gotta make them understand. 
And after Trump's election, people said, you know, maybe we need to revise and adapt the international order. And that's the problem. It's been around for 70 years. It's been great. But the geopolitics have changed, emergent of great power competition, emergence of China, emergence of India, new ideological struggle, and the, the politics within our societies have changed. So the trick is to revise and adapt the international order. And part of it is looking at existing institutions. But part of it is also recognize that there's a lot of vacant international order space to be occupied. All these new technologies do not have an international order piece. Simple stuff, transparencies, certification, standards, to make sure that there isn't some biotech lab working on a genetic mutation that is going to be the world's next pandemic. So one of the things we have is a huge e effort is required on a bipartisan basis with friends and allies, but also with China to find a way piecemeal to revise and adapt this international order. And some of it's got to be done not top down by government, but bottom up. The companies understand these technologies a lot better than governments. They're going to come up with better solutions quicker. And one of the things I've been urging organizations to do is start a conversation between national security types and the business people and let companies working in these technologies help us begin to define the international order that is going to make those technologies safe and contribute to prosperity and security. That's the challenge we have before us. I think we have a, another challenge. And that is that both domestically and internationally, we have come to a point where too many of us are viewing everything in zero-sum terms. That what is good for us internationally has to be bad for somebody else if it's really good for us, and vice versa. We are not viewing uh, our, our future prospects, our opportunities, whether security or economic, um, on the basis of, of where there are opportunities for broad, collaborative, mutually beneficial outcomes. And that's why alliances matter. That's why, you know, we can find ways to cooperate with China even as we compete with China. But, but if we define everything as us versus them, uh, we're already in a place where I think it's very hard uh, to recover. I think the same is true domestically. If we could find a consensus, a bipartisan consensus around the fact that we're all better off if we don't have whole swaths of America, whether they're urban poor or Appalachian rural poor or you know immigrant communities that are left behind and have no economic prospects, no so sense of social inclusion, um, but instead you know we're cutting low-cost housing subsidies. We're taking health care away. Uh, we are not funding basic research and development. We're allowing failing public schools to continue to fail. And we basically have decided that if, if those people can't stay on the train, if they can't catch up, then so be it. That's part of the mentality, again, a, a zero-sum mentality domestically that has gotten us to this point. So when we talk about where we have to go, we have to be in the business of wanting all of us to succeed and investing in a, in a serious way to accomplish that. And Condi was talking about our failing school. It, you know, that's a critical place to start. But the other aspects of our domestic policy that, that basically are designed to keep down those that are down is only going to exacerbate what we have now. I said in the book that I recently wrote that I, what concerns me is that what I call the four horsemen of the apocalypse are back. Populism, nativism, isolationism, protectionism. They tend to ride together. And they tend to emerge when there is a sense that uh, the elites, their governments, are not serving them well, and therefore people, desperate people, look to disruptive elements to try and change their circumstances. We've talked about populism, we've talked about, uh, the, about isolationism, we've talked about protectionism. Um, you know, nativism is really a grave threat, and it's a grave threat inside the United States and it's a grave threat outside, uh, because increasingly 
uh, we're going to our tribes and we are more comfortable with our tribes and we only speak to our tribes. The way that we get our information is that we go to our echo chamber where we only listen to people who sound like us and think like us and we encounter somebody who doesn't, we think they're stupid or they're venal. And that's across the political spectrum that that is happening. Identity politics is killing us because every identity group now has its own grievance and its own narrative. And the common American narrative, which was that it really didn't matter where you came from, it mattered where you were going, uh, it didn't matter whether your relatives came here from an Asian country or an African country or whatever, it, it was really about this opportunity that was there. That was the common narrative. That's broken down into identity narratives. And a colleague of mine at Stanford, a man named Richard Rorty, uh, gave a talk some years ago in which he said that if identity politics continued to grow in the United States, it would not be long before whites saw themselves as an identity group and began to have their own grievance and their own narrative. And I think we could say we're beginning to see exactly that. And so the question is, how do we get outside of our own nativist narratives, our own nativist, nativist grievances? My grievance is more important than your grievance because my ancestors suffered more than your ancestors. It's out of control. And until we fix that, a lot of these other issues are going to pale in comparison. Um, Tom, please. I agree, I agree with everything that uh, that Condi just said, uh, and I think that it, ra it raises a really important point, which is that it is it is simplistic to say that the dynamics underway in the Western democracies is just about globalization and economics. It's more than that, as you just laid out. I think Condi, it's a um, it's a pace of cultural change, it, it's a demographic change, and it requires leadership. I think at the end at the end of the day, it's a, it's the it's the essential leadership challenge. Of, of governing in the Western democracies going forward. So I think that's beautifully, beautifully said. On, the, um, on, on Bill's point, um, I said earlier, it is really important that we try to get ahead of the curve on technology and automation. Uh, and we're not doing it right now. There's almost no discussion in the government uh, about what the government's responsibility is in terms of the impact in labor markets of automation. Now, it may be right that the, that the you know, you have te te the, the technology priesthood would say, through history, don't worry about it, the jobs will be created, the jobs will be lost, but they'll be created by other, by other, uh, by other jobs. Um, maybe, but we are in for, at a minimum, a severe transition. Uh, and that is a really important challenge, I think, for, uh, for us. And to go to the points that Steve raised, too, on the, the ethics and kind of other kinds of issues around these technologies is something that we need a national discussion about, and the government needs to be focused on this, and Nick, which is why I think the Aston Strategy Group um, uh, topic that you and Condi and Joe picked this year is, is so important. We have not brought technology into the room enough in national security. Um, and it's uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, it's, it was one of the, it was one of the it's at the roots of the national of the Aspen Strategy Group to kind of bring the technology uh, into the uh, uh, into the room uh, and to do and we need to do it a lot more and a lot more effectively I think in order to get ahead of these problems. The last thing I'll, I think I'll, I'll say is this: um, uh, we are under a lot of pressure uh, as a society, uh, and uh, and there's you know there's a lot of discussion again about how to meet these challenges and. We have uh, institutions and programs that are looking to teach everybody coding, and as Jane pointed out, in investment in uh, STEM uh, education. Um, I said this last year, but I feel more strongly about it this year. We also need a really serious focus on um, critical thinking and civics in the United States. Um, and it is, and it is um, uh, which gives you a basis on which to have this discussion from, from a position of confidence. So thanks, Nick. Can I just say, the office that the four people here occupied of National Security Advisor, I think it's the toughest job in the executive branch. We have been so fortunate to have these four people play that role. Please thank them for me. Steve, Susan, Condi, Tom. <laughs>